So check on the, the website. I'll post the answers after I mark them, maybe on the weekend or early next week, and I'll give you the answers to the, the rest of those quiz questions. Let's finish on this topic on classical ciphers. We have seen, so you've seen some examples of very simple ciphers using first substitutions. We replace one character with another. We saw the Caesar cipher, monoalphabetic, Playfair, Visionaire, and finally the, opt, uh, the, the perfect cipher, the one-time one pad. Perfect in terms of secrecy, but not perfect in terms of practical usage. Keys are too large. So then we saw then we saw two examples of rearrangements of characters, transposition ciphers, the rail fence and the rose columns that we just did in the quiz. Rotary machines is just an example. It's an example of what was used in uh, World War II uh, and it was one example of one of the ciphers used that the armies used and it was eventually broken uh, and that was, played a, uh, an important part in, in, in the war. You can have a look in your own time. We're not going to go through how that works, the rotor cipher. It's a, uh, it's, it's a combination of multiple uh, vision air ciphers or Caesar ciphers. The last one we're going to give an example of is steganography. And this is not about encryption. We're going to focus mainly on encryption, but this is something different. And we won't talk about it in the rest of the course except here. Steganography is about hiding messages. Encrypting is about transforming a message such that someone cannot, find, cannot get that message back, even if they intercept. Here we're about hiding one plain text message inside another message, inside another plain text message. Steganography. We hide a real message inside a fake message. So we have two messages which make sense. The idea here. That is, I want to communicate one message to, a, to the destination. What I do is I take that message and somehow hide it inside another message that makes sense but is not important and send that other message with the idea if someone intercepts they see this other message they don't see it's encrypted they see this boring message and they cannot find the real hidden message inside so that's the idea with steganography some examples some old approaches. You've got a document, so a large document. You send it to someone. That document has some meaning. You send it to someone, but a selected letters in that are, are somehow marked, maybe with some invisible ink or uh, with a, 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 pin, a, a pin prick in, in the paper, such that the receiver can identify which of those selected letters are marked, and from those selected messages, our letters, they come together to form a secret message. All right, the old approaches. Nowadays, with digital messages, we, for example, when you have an image, you can modify some bits in that image, say a JPEG image, modify some bits such that those bits form a secret message and such that the image from a, human's, from a human's perspective will not look any different. Maybe some of the pixels differ, but if you look at an image and just two or three pixels are different from the original one, you will probably not notice. So the idea is to take, say, a JPEG file, an image that you want to send to someone, but modify some of the bits in the, the, the binary form, such that those bits form a secret message, send that modified JPEG to the receiver, it simply looks like a, a, a normal picture, but the receiver knows to look for selected bits inside that JPEG image to work out what the real message is. Similar can be done with video. With images and video, mainly because with a photo or a video, small changes are not perceptible to a human. Same with a video. 
you're watching a video, if some of the pixels are the wrong colour, they're not black but they're grey, just some of the pixels, you probably won't notice. They don't only display for a fraction of a second. They will not notice. But if you process that, you may be able to get some text message out of that information. That's the idea at least. The, the reason or one of the important advantages of using steganography, it doesn't look like you're hiding anything. And therefore someone who's intercepting the message <coughs> may not worry about your communications. Okay? If you can send an image to someone, someone intercepts that image and sees it's a nice image of a, a flag or a boat or a flower, they don't think it's a secret message. So they don't care. But in fact that image contains some secret message. As opposed to using encryption, okay, you encrypt a message and send it to someone. Someone who intercepts sees the ciphertext. They may not be able to get the message from decrypting, but they at least know that you're communicating something secret. If we use encryption, the attacker knows that you're trying to hide something. With steganography, the attacker doesn't necessarily know you're trying to hide something. That can be beneficial in some cases. The problem is, once the attacker knows the method that you're hiding the, uh, the real message, they can easily find the hidden message. Everything's lost. Can be in inefficient. Well, it is inefficient because to send, say, a short text message, we may have to transmit a large picture. So to get 10 bytes or 100 bytes of secret to one person, we may have to send 100 kilobytes of an image to, to the person. So it's inefficient communications. An example. Here's an example. Try and work out the message. What's the secret in this one? Say you intercepted an email that contained this text. All right, it doesn't look encrypted. There's no encryption here. It looks like a normal email, a message from one, one professor to someone else. What's the secret message here? Look at capital letters. It doesn't make sense. So that may be one approach. Use the capital letters to make a, a secret message. It doesn't work. Something else. Can anyone pick it up? Again, someone told you the answer? Okay, your package ready Friday 21st, room 3, please destroy this immediately. Look at the last, last word of each sentence, of each line in fact. Your package ready Friday 21st, room 3, please destroy this immediately. Maybe chaos, okay? So here we have one secret message hidden inside of one real message. Fake, sorry, fake message. So no one would know unless they know the, the scheme there. Of course, now that we know how it's hidden, it's easy to find the secret. That's the problem. So steganography, hide some message inside a, another fake message or a, a message that also makes sense. With the aim of hiding that you're communicating something secret. If you encrypt, people know that you're communicating something secret. Let's Let's move on to the next topic. Maybe after the break I'll show you another example of steganography with an image. Uh, let's not do it yet, because I don't have it ready.
So now we want to move on to real ciphers. What we've covered so far is just very simple ciphers. You cannot use them in practice, they're insecure. So we're going to move on to real ciphers and going through one example of a real cipher, DES, the data encryption standard. But first, before we get into DES, we're going to try and demonstrate some concepts of what is a block cipher and some of the, the ways to design a block cipher. So look at the principles of block ciphers. In fact, when we want to encrypt data, there are, we classify two types of ciphers, stream ciphers and block ciphers. And they differ based upon how much, how much input we process at a time, we encrypt at a time. Normally we, when we want to encrypt a message, the message is long, say a megabyte. We want to encrypt a file. Then what we do is we do not encrypt it all at once. We break it into parts and encrypt each part at a time, into blocks normally. Or we take the sequence of bits and encrypt them one bit at a time or maybe even one byte at a time. So that we operate on a large input message. The way that we operate it is, is categorized as either a stream cipher or a block cipher. A stream cipher, we take a stream of bits or bytes, so one bit at a time or possibly one byte at a time, and encrypt that. So let's say I, have a, uh, I want to encrypt my voice when I'm talking on the phone. So with a, a phone, say Skype or some voice over IP application, what I want to do is I talk and some bits are generated to represent my voice. As I talk, bits are generated and then sent across the internet. Well, before I send them, I want to encrypt those bits which represent my voice. So a stream cipher may be applicable here because as I generate, as I talk, my computer generates bits and then encrypts them either one bit at a time or one byte at a time and sends it. And when I'm talking, voice over IP, it's important for the implementation to be fast. That is, that there's very little delay between when I talk and when the other person receives it. So by encrypting one bit at a time as it's generated, or one byte at a time, our encryption can be done uh, in real time. That is, as the data is generated, encrypt. We'll see the other approach, block cipher. Usually the encryption operates on a larger set of bits, a block of 64 or 128 bits. And therefore, it's slower. As we generate the data, we must wait for 64 bits to be generated before we can encrypt. So a stream cipher, we take a bit or a byte at a time and encrypt it. The general approach is that we use some algorithm to generate a random stream of bits, a random sequence of bits. It's called here a cryptographic bit stream. And as we have our input, our plain text, we do an XOR, an exclusive OR. So we're operating on bits now. If you XOR the bits, we'll, so we XOR some random sequence with our plain text, we'll get a random looking ciphertext, send that ciphertext. To decrypt, we do the XOR operation again using the same random sequence and we'll get the plain text back. The important point here is an XOR implementation is usually very fast. In hardware or software, to XOR, exclusive OR, one sequence of bits or a byte against another byte is very fast operation. Okay. So stream ciphers normally can be implemented uh, such that they're very fast. To encrypt a piece of data doesn't take long. We're going to come back and we'll see examples of stream, or one example of a stream cipher in a later topic. So we'll just introduce the general concept here. A block cipher, what we do is we take our, a block of our plain text. A typical size is 64 bits or 128 bits. So I have a one megabyte file, I divide into blocks. And I encrypt a block at a time. So I take a block of plain text, some input key, an encryption algorithm, and I get a block of ciphertext the same size as the plain text as an output. And I do that for the next 
block of plain text and so on. The difference here is that the encryption algorithm usually to provide security takes significant time compared to performing an XOR, an exclusive OR. So it can be slower. And that's important when we have, for example, real-time applications that it, it's not so efficient to use a block cipher compared to a stream cipher. Stream ciphers normally for uh, real-time applications or as data is generated, we want to encrypt straight away. Block ciphers, for example, encrypting a file. The time to encrypt a file is not so important. We don't need to do it in real time. So encrypting a file or an image uh, or, um, is normally the, the domain of a block cipher. Stream cipher, as we generate the data, we want to encrypt straight away. We're going to focus on block ciphers in this topic and most of the other topics. So the assumption we have is that we're going to have a piece of plain text, uh, B bits in length. We're going to apply some encryption algorithm and get B bits of ciphertext as output. And we're going to use a key to provide security in this case. Let's use an example to illustrate some concepts of a block cipher. And the concepts are listed on this slide. Uh, what example do we have? Let's take a, a simple example and I'll see if I can make notes so you can copy it on the screen. Uh, consider the monoalphabetic cipher. The monoalphabetic cipher, remember, we take, we take, we have our letters from A to Z. The letter A maps to one of the other, or one of the 26 letters. The letter B maps to one of the 25 remaining letters. C to one of the 24 remaining letters and so on. And then to encrypt, we take our word, for example, hello, and just look up the mapping, and we get our ciphertext. Let's consider a monoalphabetic cipher, but let's say we have, instead of A through to Z, for a simple example, let's say we have A through to C, three letters, very simple. How many mappings do we have? How many, if we have a monoalphabetic cipher with three letters, how many mappings do we have for the uh, to, to ciphertext? Three factorial, which is six. So we have six possible mappings. What are they? Write them down. Write them down. Write down the mappings from A, B, C. I'll do it shortly, but you can do it first. Take you one minute. Write down the mappings if we use a monoalphabetic cipher with just three letters, A, B, C to any combination. Record them. I'll see if I can get this to work. And someone told me you need six, so I'm, I'm going to have six, and I've given you the first one. Let's see what that... So the first mapping is we map A to A, B to B, C to C. Okay, That's the first mapping. Another mapping is we have a different arrangement. Let's say, for example, A to B, B to A, and to C. And we just keep trying all the different mappings that we have available. So what have we got? A to B, B to C, C to A, and what's another one? 
A to A, B to C, A to C, A B, C B A. And that's all we have. We have six possible mappings. Okay? So that's the, in this case, how many? It's because we have three letters, it's three factorial. So six possible mappings. What's the key in this cipher? Well, how many keys do we have? How many possible keys? Six. A key tells us how we map from one to another. So we have six possible keys. What's the key in the first case? Or how could we write down the key in that first mapping? The key we could write down as the sequence of letters in the, the ciphertext. That is, this is the key in the first case. This is a key. For example, the key in the first case is simply ABC. And then the second case is BAC. And the third, third one is BCA and so on. So, in this case we have six keys and each key is three letters in length. Any questions on that? So all I've done is I've written down the six possible mappings or transformations from plain text on the left to cipher text on the right. So when I have the, I want to encrypt the letter, or the, the two letters AB, then I need to know the key. If the key is BAC, this one, if the key is BAC and the plain text is AB, then what's the cipher text? BA. That is, using this key, if this plain text is AB, then A becomes A becomes B and B becomes A in this case. So plain text is AB, cipher text is BA in this mapping. So that's one way we can specify the key in this case. We have six keys and each key is three characters in length. Now let's do the same thing but let's do it with a uh, binary input. Instead of letters, let's deal with let's deal with uh, binary. And from now on most of the things we'll do is in binary. Let me See if I can fix this. Maybe. I can work out my computer. Let's try again, but let's say we have, instead of three letters, A, B, and C, we have a four bit number. So the input is a 4-bit number. Do the same thing. We write them all down. So 4-bit number, we start with, if I can write, work this out slowly. I've lost it. You can list them all. I won't do them all. Take too long. How many do we have? Sixteen possible values, and so our input is a four-bit number. Then we can write down all the possible transformations or mappings. So one possible mapping is that, for example, the simplest one is that four zeros maps to four zeros, and so on. That's one mapping. And another mapping is if, for example, 
four zeros maps to something different. So the first column in this picture is the plain text. The second column is one case of ciphertext. And the third column is a second case of ciphertext, a different mapping. So the first one is that all right, the input plain text becomes the same on the, the ciphertext. The second one is if we take this as plain text, this is what we get as ciphertext. How many possible mappings do we have? 16 factorial, okay? Because there are 16 input values. There are 16 different uh, so there are 16 factorial arrangements or permutations of those 16 values. And the same before, we had three input values, A, B, and C. The number of arrangements we can have is three factorial. Now we have 16 input values, zero through to 15, or in binary, as shown there. So we have 16 factorial possible arrangements. How big is our key? So we have 16 factorial arrangements, or in other words, keys. How big is the key? 16 what? Remember in the, the letters, we had six keys. A key was specified by the arrangement of the ciphertext. For example, in the first case, the red one was A, B, and C. In the second case, it was B, A, C. We had a three-letter key. Now, how long is the key in this case? 64 bits. It is this sequence of bits here, this column. And if you count, it's 4 by 16. The key length is 64 bits in this case. That's the key length, and the number of keys is 16 factorial. So by moving to a binary uh, plain text in this case, we've got a 64-bit key, and 64-bit in length key, and 16 factorial possible keys. In general, with an n-bit block, so this is our block of text. Here we have a 4-bit block. With an n-bit block, the number of keys is 2 to the power of n factorial. Here we have a 4-bit block. It's 2 to the power of 4 factorial is the number of keys. So n-bit, 2 to the power of n factorial. And the key length, if we encrypt like this, is what? n multiplied by 2 to the power of n. In this case, it's... 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, multiplied by 16. n multiplied by 2 to the power of n is the key length. So that's one way we can implement a block cipher. We map from every possible input plain text to any arrangement in the cipher text. In the slides, there's a, an example. an example of one possible mapping here. So on, on the picture I tried to draw two possible mappings. Here's a third one. Here's the all 16 values. And here's one arrangement of the ciphertext. Okay. There are, of course, 2 to the power of 4. There's 16 factorial possible combinations like this one, but different. This is just one example. Ignore the second table for now. One way we can describe such a cipher, what we do to encrypt, if I have input text, for example, 1000, I have some input, 1000, I look it up here, 1000, and find the corresponding cipher text, 0011, and that's the output. Very simple. It's just a lookup of this table. That is described in a, in a different form in a, uh, a, as a picture in here, where we take our four bit input, our four bits of plain text, 
that maps to one of here, one of 16 possible values, 0 to the 15 in decimal. In binary, it's 0, 0, 0, 0 through to 1, 1, 1, 1. To simplify, this diagram shown as in decimal from 0 to, six, to 15. And so the input then maps to some output. In our example, what do we have? For example, the input, what do we have? 1, 0, 0, 0, which is 8, maps to 0, 0, 1, 1, which is 3. And I think, let's hope it's true in this case. 8, if the input is 8 in decimal, then the output is 3 in binary. That's all. There's nothing, although it looks complex there, it's just a direct mapping from one input to one output. That's a way to implement a block cipher. So, and what we'll call is the ideal block cipher. We take our input plaintext, a sequence of n bits, and we have some mapping that tells us the, uh, the arrangement of those 2 to the power of n possible inputs to the 2 to the power of n possible outputs. And the key tells us the arrangement. So this arrangement is caused by one key. A different key would see a different arrangement here. And we know the number of keys that we have. So we can flick through between the picture and uh, different slides. Let's record what we know so far. With an n bit block, of plain text, we've got 2 to the power of n factorial keys, which are possible. That's what we've calculated with an n bit. In our case, when we had a 4 bit block, we had 16 factorial possible keys, possible transformations. The key length was n times 2 to the power of n. That's the key length. n by 2 to the power of n bit key. And of course, we get an n bit block of ciphertext as the output. So just provide a mapping from one of the possible inputs to one of the other possible ciphertext outputs. This is one way to implement a block cipher. The problem with it is that there's some, it's very inefficient in terms of the length of the key. That's why we're trying to illustrate through example the length of the key. We'll see it doesn't work so well. So it's described here, I think. An ideal block cipher, we take an n-bit input, it maps to 2 to the power of n possible input states. That's like here. n-bit input maps to 2 to the power of n, in this case 16 possible inputs. And then we do a substitution. We replace one input, or we replace the input with one of the other values. We substitute which is what we're doing here. We replace 1, 0, 0, 0 with 0, 0, 1, 1. That's the substitution operation. And we get an output of n-bit ciphertext. It looks complex on some of these slides and maybe the, the general description is complex, but it, it's conceptually much, quite easy. We just take our input and choose one of the possible outputs. The key tells us which possible output. This is what's called an ideal block cipher. It allows the maximum number of possible encryption mappings. So we've got all possible keys, all possible combinations. We cannot do any better. We, would, we can possibly in, implement a cipher using this approach, but there are two practical problems. And it's to do with the block size. If we have a small block size, we'll see, and I'll show with some example or an example, that 
it's very easy to break using the, the statistical characteristics of the input. I'll come back to that one with explain why. The other approach that, so assuming we cannot have a small block size, have a large block size. Make n large. But the problem with a large block size is the key must be very large. Let's d easily demonstrate that. Let's, for example, set the key to be uh, the block to say 64 bits. N is 64. How big is our key? If, we, if N is 64, so the block, we encrypt 64 bits at a time, the block size is 64, which is large uh, in the context of the ciphers. How big is the key? is 64 multiplied by 2 to the power of 64. Anyone got a calculator? Can calculate that? So the key length, and remember the key, okay, something by 10 to the power of 21. About 10 to the power of 21. That's the key length bits, which is about, convert the bytes, it's about 150 million terabytes. That's the size of our key. Remember with the key, what do we use it for? The person who wants to encrypt, encrypts with that key, gets the ciphertext and sends the ciphertext to the other side. We assume that somehow, prior to that, I delivered the key that I chose to the other person. So the way to deliver this key is to take 150 million hard drives and pass them to the other person. It's not possible. The key length is too large here. Okay? That's the, the case of if we, if we have a large block size, 64 is large enough, the key is too big and we cannot exchange the key with anyone. So it's very impractical from that perspective. What about if we have, therefore, let's make n smaller, a smaller box size. If n is smaller, then our key is going to be much smaller. In our example, how big was it? Four bits. And our key was 64 bits. So let's try that. What's the disadvantage of that approach? Just record what we had. How are we going with time? Okay. So n was 4. The block size was 4 bits, like we had in our example. Then the key length is 64 bits. That's fine. I encrypt something and Somehow I passed you a 64-bit key. I write down eight bytes and give them to you on a piece of paper or, or in some other secure mechanism. That's easy to distribute a 64-bit key. But what's the problem? The problem is that we can, when we have a long plain text, we will get many repetitions of each block. And therefore we'll have repetitions in the output ciphertext. And when you have repetitions in the output ciphertext, then an attacker can use that to look at the statistical characteristics of the input, match them to what they see in the output ciphertext, and then try and work out, okay, which ciphertext maps to which plaintext. The same way that we uh, can break the, the monoalphabetic cipher. We know that, for example, there are 12% E's the letter E in English. So in the plain text there should be 12% E's. So if there are 12% of the letter G in the cipher text, that suggests G in the cipher text maps to E in the plain text. Similar here. Let's give an example.
we have our four bits of input plain text and let's say the letter E is our message is in English but we map it using ASCII to to binary the letter E is I, I've looked it up is 101 which is if we represent it as a 8-bit number 0110 so every time we have a letter E let's say we have a long message we want to encrypt a long document one megabyte many E's in there we expect 12% 12, 12 of the letters will be E then what we do is we take the ASCII representation I've made an 8-bit uh, value to make it easy and we encrypt that but our block size is 4 bits so what we do is we encrypt this 4 bits and then we get some ciphertext and then we encrypt these 4 bits and we get some ciphertext what would we get if we used our cipher let's look it up uh, using for example this mapping we get if we encrypt 0110, 0110 is the first four bits, we get 1011. If we encrypt 0, if we encrypt the, the plain text 0110, we get 1011, and then we encrypt 0101. 0101 gives us from this mapping 1111. So every time we have the letter E in our input plain text, we're going to get these four bits on input and we'll get these four bits on output. Because we have many E's in the input plain text, about 12% of the letters will be the letter E, then 12% of the output ciphertext will be this sequence of 8 bits. So we'll be able to recognize that repetition and that makes it easier for an attacker to work out that the mapping from 0111 most likely maps, or the mapping of 1011111 1, most likely maps to this input plaintext because we would see this sequence of 8 bits approximately 12% of the time in the ciphertext and therefore we'd make the guess that these 8 bits correspond to these 8 bits of plaintext so with a small block we'll get many repetitions and then we can take advantage of the statistical repetition or the stati statistical characteristics if we increase the block size to be, say, 64 bits, then the letter E is these 8 bits, but with 64 bits, we have another 56 bits along at the end. And we encrypt all 64 bits at once and get some ciphertext as output. So, in fact, with 64 bits, we have 8 different letters. So every time we have a combination of eight letters in the same, we'll get the same output ciphertext. But it's very unlikely that you're going to have many repetitions of the eight same letters in a row. So it's much more unlikely that you'll see structure in the output if you use a larger block. So the end point is use a large block, use a, use a large block to avoid repetitions in the output and uh, make it harder for the attacker to do statistical analysis but use a small block to get the key length small well neither of them work in practice if we want a small key length we'll be insecure but if we have to have a large block to be secure we'll get a large key length that's why this approach is not used in practice it's the ideal block cipher, but it's not very practical. One more thing that we missed here. So that's the problems with the ideal block cipher. Before we finish for a break, 
Another thing that is required for our block ciphers is that our mappings must be reversible. A reversible mapper, mapping from plaintext to ciphertext is one such that when you have the ciphertext you can uniquely get the, the same plaintext back. This is reversible in that if I encrypt 0, 1, I'll get 1, 0. And when I have the ciphertext 1, 0 to decrypt, I will get 0, 1 again. 100%. This is irreversible. I encrypt 1, 0, I get 0, 1 as ciphertext. I decrypt ciphertext 0, 1, what's the plain text? Either of these two, we don't know, you see. That's irreversible. We must have a one-to-one -one mapping between plain text and ciphertext. That's the, a key requirement of our ciphers. If we don't, then we cannot decrypt correctly because I don't know which plain text is the real one. Okay. So we need a reversible mapping or a one-to-one -one mapping between plain text and ciphertext. So an ideal block cipher, we've gone through the basic structure of it, but the problem is the block size. Small block size, insecure, because we can do frequency analysis. Large block size, key is too big, impractical. So what do we do? A guy named Feist will come up with a different approach, which is common in many ciphers. What it does, instead of having this, this direct mapping, it takes much smaller, simpler ciphers, smaller block, cipher, block sizes, but it applies them in sequence. So it doesn't just do one transformation, it does one and then another and another such that the result is secure, we say cryptographically strong. And in fact what it does is it alternates substitutions with transpositions. We went through transposition and substitution ciphers in the classical ciphers. The Faisal structure just uses those same concepts and it does a substitution and then rearranges and then it does it again. Substitution, rearrange and it does it in what's called rounds, one round after another or different phases, such that the result is secure, that is, it's not subject to frequency analysis attacks, and the key length is small. And in fact, we have an n-bit block and a k-bit key, as opposed to an n-bit block and an n times n, uh, 2 to the power of n-bit key. With the Faisal structure, we just have a k-bit key, usually 64 bits or, or larger. and it applies concepts of diffusion and confusion. And I suspect confusion is where most of you are at. So let's stop there and after the break what we'll do is describe the Feistel structure, what these concepts are and look at a real example implementation. <laughs>